Hello, uh, my name is Paris Alexander. Uh, we're here at my sort of private hideout studio, uh, just on the cusp of the end of Raleigh. Uh, this is the place where I come and do all my stone carving and that. Otherwise, you could find me, and, and I'd like to do a little shout out here for our new uh, CMAC, which is City Market Artist Collective, which is in uh, downtown City Market. It's a brand new gallery space. We have a whole uh, group of uh, fantastic uh, artists, 2D artists, 3D artists, and all that. Uh, we were only open a month before the world sort of turned upside down. But uh, we are going to quickly be get things rolling back there uh, again, so make sure you, you come on down. We also have a number of guest artists, and in actuality, uh, I'm still, uh, you know, I'm trying to, you know, keep carrying on with everything uh, during this uh, period that we're going through. I'm still trying to get not only work done, but also, uh, you know, keep life rolling, uh, which is uh, something else I'm doing over at CMAC, is a series of guest artists, and we have them now lined up going all the way into next year. So, uh, lots of artists are out there just, you know, biting at the bit to, to get back in there and uh, do what they do and hopefully keep everything vibrant once we all, uh, you know, are able to uh, get through uh, the times that we're, we're getting through right now. But, uh, has some great artists coming up uh, there. Keep an eye out. Uh, guest artist CMAC is at 300 Blake Street, right in downtown City Market. Make sure you come over there. But what I'm going to show you over here is my carving studio. Uh, it's not huge, but one of the things that uh, you have to remember about stone is the sheer weight of it a lot of times is, uh, is so heavy. I've got a gantry crane and some things like that over, over there for moving you know, several ton blocks of, of stone. And a lot of times they, it'll wind up uh, where the stone is basically getting put right here. And I move around it and it just sort of stays, stays put uh, as I carve it. And I get a wonderful light there. I've got some skylights coming in because you know, lighting is a really important thing for, uh, for a sculptor, looking at your depth and how you're gonna approach it. Uh, one of the things that I do as a, as a professional artist is uh, I keep my fingers in a lot of different situations uh, because sometimes, especially with stone, you can get a little uh, over caught up in some particular aspect of things and uh, it's, it's good to step away. So I like to be able to have little things for myself, other projects that I'm doing, sometimes lar larger and bigger. Right now, literally with everything that's going on, some of my larger projects were putting on hold a little bit uh, as we uh, continue to uh, sort of talk about and, and, and plan those out, but you know, they're coming down the, down the line. Uh, this is an interesting uh, series of works I'm doing. This is Horace uh, Farlow that the uh, Gregg Museum asked me. Uh, unfortunately, it was, it was in his previous location. A good deal of damage happened to it. It was uh, uh, moved with a forklift kind of roughly, and so I'm reconditioning it. Uh, this is some of the pieces that are already done. There's more already done pieces there. And uh, I love Horace Farlow's work. I did get to meet him uh, near the end of his life, and he was a, a great guy. I actually got to show some of my work alongside his, which, which was a real honor. So it's a real honor to come back so many years after he's passed away and be able to you know, uh, get a work of his ready for going in a, a great place like the Great Museum. Uh, I also keep a lot of odd and end stones. Whenever I have a commission, uh, I'll always take and order some extra stone, not only so that uh, I can make sure that if something goes a little awry for me, uh, I, I have a backup, but I also like to just, you know, be able to just come over and pick up something and decide to, to knock on it. I've got all kinds of things. There's uh, limestone and uh, all kinds of different limestone, some that's from uh, Mexico. We've got some beautiful Italian uh, Carrera marble. This is like a gray Carrera. And then there's some uh, larger uh, blocks of white Carrera down there. This is actually a big, beautiful piece of, of Carrera marble down there. And uh, lots of limestone. And one of the things I thought about when I was going to you know, uh, make this video was I thought I'd, I'd think of all the questions that a lot of people ask me uh, when they come to my studio. I mean, I had a studio for many years over at ArtSpace. And again, I'm transitioning over to uh, CMAC coming up. Uh, uh, and so I, I'm used to having a lot of people come in, ask me a lot of questions, how things are made, what type of stone is it, and, and how, you, how you polish things, and, and all stuff like that. Uh, one of the frequent questions is limestone, how does it hold up outside? And I always point out that just about all the great cathedrals and that that you see not only in Europe but in the United States 
are carved in limestone. And many of the buildings, when you look downtown, they're uh, all limestone carved. And I get most of mine from uh, Indiana, but it comes from many, many uh, states as well as uh, different parts of the world. And you get all kinds of different colors. This is actually uh, a Jerusalem stone, which is a type of uh, uh, limestone that comes out of Israel. Uh, and I've done some uh, letter carving in that uh, over at the Justice Center downtown, which is another thing that I sort of keep my, my fingers in. I do uh, letter carving. I've done a lot of uh, on-site uh, 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 works, uh, carved the front of chapels. I did a whole series for Wake Med Hospitals. If you get a chance, ParasailAlexander.org. You can check out some of my works on there. I'm really terrible about updating things, so I haven't updated in a while. I've got a new website, but ParasailAlexander.org. Uh, you can check out some of the works that I've already have done. Uh, another real frequent question, we can go back to looking at the Horace Farlow piece, uh, is how are things, how do I get a polish on it? And for, you know, large works uh, that have these simple planes going on, you can actually use a, uh, a diamond polishing pad that you've got water coming out and, uh, and then you're able to uh, really go on to big surfaces and, and polish it up and use all different grits of those diamond pads and you can get a really super slick smooth. I'm trying to follow what I knew that Horace uh, liked is his pieces to do is not super shiny but just just a little bit to get the uh, that glaze sort of look off of it. Uh, but you can't really do that when you're talking about, you know, figurative works and all that. So you can't just take a big buffing pad, especially small pieces, but even when you get into larger pieces and all that, you can't take just a buffing pad to it. Uh, because it, they're not all flat surfaces. So a lot of these are good old, uh, I usually go over that part of the studio. I've got a water system that sort of just sort of drips water on it. And I'll use uh, pads. I even have little Velcro ones that go on the ends of my gloves. And then ultimately even get down to wet and dry paper. But a lot of it is good old fashioned just, you know, hand doing things. Now I make all my own bases and then I'll, I'll use the, the polishing uh, tool for all that. Uh, it's a good example on some of some of these ones. Like here's 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 a little uh, limestone piece, and you can see some of the different textures I get with different types of chisel. This is a type of uh, uh, point chisel. What I had uh, a good number of them custom made for me. I like the sort of flat ones because one of the things I learned early on was uh, when I'm making a piece, uh, and especially in the beginning. I always wanted just a really beautiful, perfect uh, surface to it. I polish up everything, make it perfect, and the people would come along and they'd be like, "What's that made out of? Is that concrete? Is that this or that?" And it was a little discouraging. Uh, and I, I started learning that if you leave all the chisel marks on it, not only do you get to uh, show people how it was kind of made, but it also can you can play around with all the different textures, like I sort of did in pieces like that. And now I've gotten to the point where many of my pieces I don't even polish or if I do it's very very specific little areas just so I can show the, the uh, variation and texture and, and design and all that uh, so what, what I th also thought I'd show you is taking and uh, seeing how to piece I've got a little piece here I was just doing for myself uh, what it is I don't exactly know it is I have this whole and, series uh, and then I uh, just sort of wing it as I go along. Sometimes I'll do a little sketch on a piece of paper and just sort of think about it and it usually completely changes. Uh, this one I did have some idea that we're going to have these sort of ribbons that are flowing in and out through this sort of uh, abstracted form that will eventually have these places uh, carved completely out. And what I've done, I've marked everything up a little bit so I can see generally where I'm going and have a, a, a rough plan. I never completely stick to the plan. And, and here's something to talk about too that a lot of people ask me, like, what kind of tools do you use? And I, I'm real mercenary at it. Uh, I originally learned uh, using just hand tools and that, and when I teach students, that's what I do too, because uh, one way or another, you're gonna come back to it. Also, if you use hand tools right, you can move a lot of stone more than a pneumatic chisel. And I do use a, a pneumatics at times, and if for you, those who don't realize what I'm talking about, pneumatics is literally an air driven, it's like an air driven uh, piston. We won't do that now because it makes a whole lot of noise, but I can explain at what point that I would sort of use it. But the first thing that I would do is uh, I take like a masonry saw for a piece like this. I don't do this typically in uh, figurative work. 
uh, or things with a, a lot of different little details because it's, it would be a little bit heavy handed for me. I'd get right in with the point chisel and do it. But here's what I did. I knew that I absolutely wanted to be knocking out this stone in the center and I knew that I wanted some of these areas that are going to be left high and then I'm going to knock around uh, some of the other ones. So what I did was I literally took a masonry saw and I dropped it in here and masonry saw is literally, you know, like a, uh, a, a simple wood saw, you know, that you use an electric wood saw, but these ones have masonry uh, cutters on them, which are just diamond blades that you're going to cut in, into the surface. And I've got all different sizes from this big down to little tiny ones, but I put these little cuts and all that in it. And what that does is it loosens up the stone so that what I can do is come in next with a good old traditional point chisel and then I'll take some of these areas that I've loosened up a little bit and I just start now I will say one thing I don't have going on that I typically do is uh, I love listening to music but I figured for the video today that was going to get a little disturbed but usually a lot of music and I just I love soda sitting here. One of the other things that people always ask me is, uh, or assume that I have a tremendous amount of patience, and I really don't. And the thing is that with a piece of stone, uh, you, you get to see exactly something happen. You, you, you swing your hammer and things are happening instantly. So to me, it's not for somebody that has to be super patient. It's just the opposite for me, because I get to see instantly you know, what I'm doing, and I'm, I'm making a change. And in fact, I'm making a change. I mean, these, these are compact fossils. And I always think about, too, that, you know, I'm now uh, hammering my way through very ancient sediments. And sometimes I'll come across all, uh, sometimes little fish fossils and, and different things like that. And I've, uh, previously, I've sometimes even worked those into the design if they're really pretty spectacular. But you can see how having done this crisscross with the saw has enabled places for this to come out. And listen to the sound a little bit. You hear a different concussion just before it sort of breaks. And sometimes when I'm teaching, I'll, uh, I'll be able to hear from across the room whether a student's work is, I'll be able to say, you know, stop right there. Don't, it's, it's ready to break and maybe a place you don't want it to. You'll hear like a dull thud. Uh, when you get a really large piece that I'm working on, and I really love this aspect of it, that I'll hear, uh, you'll get this wonderful ringing going on. And actually the Japanese used to make these big uh, stone uh, circles that you could take and, and ring them like bells. And sometimes when I'm working on a piece, I'll get to uh, hear that going on. Let me get a little bit down here. The other thing, and when I'm teaching students, I tell them to, uh, you know, really be watching. Where is the chisel going? What's it doing? And see that something's happening. Sometimes if it's, you go too straight in and you're not doing anything, you need to change your angle a little bit. But you should, should be seeing things happening all the time. stone out of the way. Now, I was tentatively thinking about with this piece, you know, ultimately this is going to be the bottom where it's going to, it's going to sit up. These holes are going to go all the way straight through it. I want to be able to see, and I want to have these bands of stone that'll wrap around it. I don't know whether I'm going to polish them or not. A lot of what I do when I'm doing these things for myself, I make it up as I go along. That way you can't possibly make any mistakes, right? If you're just making it up as you go along, you can't possibly make a mistake. Very satisfying thing when you can take out nice size. Now, when I'm doing a really large piece, I've got some big chisels over there. I'll, I'll grab them.
but you can even use ones like this. This is typically going to be on the ends of blocks. I'm being a little delicate because I don't want that whole sort of section out. And you can see I've tried to mark in dark so I can... Sometimes you get in your little zone and you kind of forget any kind of plan that you had. And I, Many times I've taken off pieces that I didn't really quite want to take off. But you can see with that concept, if you have a really big piece, I could put really big slits and I could just come through here and knock off a whole bunch of stone. Uh, and that's in contrast to using a pneumatic chisel, which is really taking off, a, it's a lot of repetitive little hits that I'll use near the end for uh, creating a certain surface uh, that I'm gonna put on it. Uh, especially if I'm looking for a real sort of flowing surface because there are a lot of little hits that are just sort of in in there and for evening out the surface but in the beginning what I use mainly is these point chisels here's one I even made I made this when I was about so oh, 15 years old and I took it I saw it in a, a book by uh, Mavino Hoffman and it was particularly for uh, a point chisel for limestone and what it does is as it goes in it actually, the way it's designed, it twists a little bit so it can push out really nice, good chunks of stone. kids actually used to uh, like coming into my studio and I'd always have all these little squares and stuff and they'd pile them up and make little things out of them and all. Now they don't care about such things. My daughter, by the way, is our uh, my camera person today. <laughs> Do you remember coming in here when you were a kid? And banging on stone? <laughs> you don't know. Yeah, it's been a while since you hit on some stone. One of the other things I've started doing as of late is, uh, and I'm sort of somewhat referring to it jokingly, is uh, my retirement plan, which is doing bronzes. And I'm really, really loving doing that. And in fact, a good... Uh, friend of mine, uh, Steve Little, and I, we're going to uh, set up a bronze uh, workshop where we're going to have uh, some of the students come in and be doing uh, waxes, because uh, we're going to do the lost wax uh, technique, and have them come into CMAC and do the waxes, and then we're going to go over to uh, Dorm and do the casting over that way. Now, again, this is the ribbon I want to keep, so you gotta also watch your angle and how you come back and know just where to sort of stop hitting. And sure, at some point too, I'll definitely take a just a, a masonry drill and just sort of drill a series of holes right through the stone. And that way I can get in there and uh, really see exactly where I'm, I'm going. But also, I'm, I'll play around sometimes. I like playing around with different angles that I go in so that uh, I never like it uh, a piece to be uh, repetitive from side to side. I always like having, almost as if they're two release put together, but of two different things that somehow you've blended them together. I like a little surprise. I did a, a large hand one. I really like doing hands, and I did a large hand uh, that I uh, still actually have. It's, it's one of my favorite pieces. Where on one side I sort of have you know the regular hand, and you see all the the palm, and I even did the finger uh, prints and and that in it. And on the other side I did all the bones, sort of the life and death uh, version of things. Can 
get a ringing starting to happen on the stone. One of my favorite things. And you don't want to jump around, you want to be a little methodical. So I make these little striations, these furrows that go into the stone. And I don't go too far away because that way each one kind of loosens up the next row. And I would say, you know, you could go over to the North Carolina Museum of Art and you could peek around behind it, you know, uh, you don't want to get too close, the guards don't like it a whole lot, but you can peek around behind them and you can still see some of these same chisel marks from like the point chisels and all that as they're roughing out the block. You can see some of these same uh, types of tools that are being used in there. One of the other tools that uh, I use a lot, it's one of my favorite, is a uh, sometimes referred to as a tooth chisel or a claw chisel. The tooth ones tend to have uh, little sharper points. I like the ones with a little bit of uh, flat points uh, on them. And they'll have all, the, sometimes it's just three, sometimes six or seven teeth on, depending on what stone you're using. And, uh, and uh, the, the density of the stone. Like you wouldn't use a, a chisel like this for uh, granite. When I have, my granite tools are going to be ones that have uh, carbide tips on them. Uh, one of the hardest metals that you can, and the, the angle for a, a, a granite, piece of granite is, is almost 90 degrees. You're crushing the stone as you sort of go through. With uh, limestone and marbles, you can actually be carving it and, and moving off the surface of it. What you do with uh, a chisel like this, you can see I started over here, and this was uh, Michelangelo's favorite tool. You, you see it on a, a lot of his things. Uh, a lot of his works, so you'll see the same sort of tool being used. So it's been a lot of years. But that's what's making these sort of marks. And it's not, I'm not just trying to make marks, and this is one thing I tell students as well, you're shaping. And I think what I'm gonna do with this block is I'm gonna leave these ribbons sort of up high, you can sort of see where I'm starting to do that. And then I'm gonna take these areas, and just get them substantially lower than those ribbon sort of areas. And, you know, one, I'm not swinging real hard. It's all about getting used to the angle. And I just put the angle, and this is really, I'm just more picking up the hammer and letting its own weight drop it down to where it needs to be. To me, this is a very therapeutic, I love being here. Uh, I've got my studio is actually it's built halfway into a hillside, so it during the summers it stays pretty cool, and uh, during the winter times the sun just sort of piles in here. So I'm usually nice and comfortable and doing my own thing. It's a rare thing that anyone even stops in. Kind of like it that way. Sometimes you just gotta get into your zone. Now another thing I'll tell students a lot is don't get so caught up in a single direction. It helps you sort of flesh out what it is you're doing. And that's what makes those sort of marks and striations as you, as you go through. Now later on what I can do is I can play around with uh, whether or not I want to polish these. Uh, I'll have to take a, take a look and I'll have to think about that. Uh, or whether I'll uh, do various, some sort of long chisel marks going across it. I like, I like there to be a nice variance with it. Let's go ahead and get these edges off.
Now sometimes, yeah, I would come in with a uh, pneumatic and be running through here, but I like to feel around the piece first and just sort of think about what is it I want to do. And right now this is very much just sort of feeling around, hey, where do I want things to go? What parts do I want to keep and what parts do I want to get rid of? Let me get a flat chisel over there. So for a small piece of limestone, that's just a flat chisel. Uh, sometimes called a finishing chisel. If you really want to go over the surface and be able to get rid of all the starvations, you could use that. This is one that is for granite. So you can see the, the carbide is uh, fused right onto, onto that. And again, for the granite, you're really going straight down. This is definitely overkill for this little, little tiny piece we got going on here. But we've got some things over this way. Just giving it a knock around enough. I can see where it gets loosened up. Once I get this down to a certain depth, what I'll do again is probably hit it again with the masonry. Saw, get a little more depth in it, and then literally take a, a drill and drill down some depth. I love when you finally hit the other part of the stone, other half, and you actually pop out the other side. And you just sort of think, well, that's the first time in X number of million years that uh, light has shined through this area. That's what I do a lot of the day, and uh, I bet you you'll wind up seeing this piece uh, over at uh, CMAC uh, coming up in not too long when uh, the world uh, gets past all this stuff. I'm lucky in that I, uh, I get to come in here by myself and sort of do my thing and get a little caught up with work, uh, and I know that it's not that easy for a lot of other people, uh, and I'm sorry for that. But uh, hopefully, I, I mean, I know that a lot of my artist friends are all uh, being affected by this in a lot of ways, including in their work. So, you know, it would be interesting to see the types of works that are all uh, out of all this. And so uh, the Raleigh Downtown Alliance has really welcomed CMAC into downtown. They've come over, they've uh, really encouraged us. And right now it's kind of the home for about uh, 10 artists that are in there full-time and well 11 I'm forgetting myself and then we got a guest artist coming in all the time so uh, hope to see you all over there 300 Blake Street and 
thanks for stopping in.